Okay, thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm Simon Ford. I'm here from Arm. Um, I've been at Arm about 12 years now, um, working on lots of technology and obviously seen Arm come from quite a small company, I guess, to what I guess now for the UK is, is actually quite a large company. Um, we've got four speakers after me who are going to talk about different segments uh, and the opportunities within those segments. Um, so what I wanted to do is actually talk about um, a few observations I think we've had um, that make a lot of how this is going to play out quite predictable. Um, and hopefully they'll um, give you a few insights that will uh, understand how how the, maybe this industry is going to play out and, and why that might influence um, how we, uh, we help uh, make that happen in the UK. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is we have the technology now. Um, so we get asked a lot, is this M2M, you know, growing? Is this, where's this come from? Why now? A actually, you know, from inside the industry, this is incredibly predictable. So for the last 10 years, We've been working on all these sorts of technologies that are leading up to uh, enabling uh, this to happen. So about 10 years ago, for example, ARM started working on a dedicated microcontroller architecture. So microcontrollers were going to be very big um, and has worked on that since. And with our partners, we've uh, developed um, all sorts of technology that is now um, getting to the point where radios are being integrated onto the same chip battery, you know, cell, cell um, style batteries can be used uh, for years. All of this is incredibly predictable. And sometimes it's easy to forget that you're kind of behind the curtain. And there's a, you know, the classic phrase of uh, technology uh, advanced enough is, is indistinguishable from magic. And I think sometimes, as an industry, we forget that. And these things can just appear from nowhere. And it's very hard for people to get a grasp of actually what, what's behind it, why this has happened, what the implications of it are going to be, and how it's going to how it's going to uh, roll out. Um, and I think it's actually a responsibility of our industry to uh, make sure that information is, is understood. Because it's not magic. It's very predictable. Um, and once you understand the tricks, uh, it's, it's very simple to understand how you can apply them. Um, but I think it's even a bit worse uh, than that. But I'll come on to that in a second. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea of the scale, um, some of you will, will have a feel for these sorts of numbers, but it's incredible how many people don't. So last year, ARM shipped about, uh, with its partners, about 2 billion microcontrollers. So that's a, a lot of technology. And if you look at the growth of this, this, you know, this these, are, these are massive numbers making this technology uh, available at, at the sort of uh, uh, price you're thinking that the, uh, you know, the bolt on the case of the, the thing you're putting it into might be. So, it's changing a lot of the uh, dimensions about what, it, what the cost of embedding intelligence into a product is. Again, very predictable, but, but not, not always obvious. I think the interesting thing that's happening about now is actually a lot of things are converging. So low-power wireless radios, microcontrollers, uh, uh, battery and uh, scavenging technology and things like this. If you actually look at all the trends, they're kind of coming together now at the perfect time, where uh, at the same time you have data center cloud te uh, technology also um, reaching a sort of a level of understanding maturity that it becomes standard practice to, um, to deploy. It's, it's, it's not an unknown anymore. This is no longer a research topic. <clears throat> and and um, the, the, I guess the third, the third thing is um, uh, MEMS technology has, has brought a lot of um, sensor technology to the silicon world. And, Again, the cost of production of sensors now has uh, become a fraction of what it was a few years ago. And that's widely available. And there's, a lot of actually, there's actually a lot of that research going on in Europe. Um, and just to give you an example, this is a microcontroller. It's a couple of millimeters squared. But you can buy it through distribution for, for 50 cents or something like that. And that's a 32-bit computer on a chip, the sort of technology that was in your Nokia uh, in the early days when you were playing Snake. Um, so this is widely available. In the, if you look in the research labs, we've got things like one millimeter squared, uh, uh, one millimeter cubed processors where we have in the same package um, a solar panel, a battery, um, a sensor, and a microcontroller. You know, so that, that, but that, that's crazy sort of research. But this sort of stuff, you can actually go online, buy it now in one-off if you want. 
it's, uh, this technology is readily accessible. But, uh, but I said there was a, potentially a bit of a problem that the industry has, and that is that technology doesn't equal reality. And again, I think our industry can sometimes be responsible for thinking that the technology is, is the end, or even not being able to predict how that technology should be used. So I liked this uh, magazine article because in 1957, uh, uh, it was predicting in 10 years' time how everyone was going to have the flying car, and that this was probably serious at the time. Um, but the point was, the technology probably was there, actually. But that's not going to make it a reality. There's a lot of political, um, commercial, social aspects that come into these things. And actually, often the, 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 in, the industry, what I would call the, the technology industry, is often ignorant to those realities. And that's something to be very conscious of uh, in, in uh, the way that art, some, sometimes the industry who has made the magic actually predict, predicts how those tricks are going to play out. So I kind of want you to remember this very seriously because I think it has a big influence on how you stimulate the market. A good way to look at uh, how things are going to play out is to actually look at the past. So ARM obviously ma made its success by um, helping pioneer the smartphone, the, the, the mobile phone industry. Um, and again, in some ways, it was entirely predictable. At one point when I was working on you know, the, the latest smartphone chips, and I think at the time Nokia was saying how it was going to be plugged into a TV, and we were just getting color screens, and this seemed a bit crazy, but you could see how this was actually going to play out, uh, and, and it did play out. Um, certainly from ARM's point of view, we spent a lot of time working on the technology that goes into the handsets to actually make them exist. Um, whether that's the radio chips, baseband processors, applications processors, graphics chips, things like that. Um, also, a lot of advancements in, in things like um, you know, battery technology. So that's something we were very aware of. But there's some other things that enabled it to happen, which perhaps weren't even uh, due to the mobile industry in the first place, but, but accelerated some of these things. Um, so a real tipping point was when standards-based in internet was brought to mobile applications. And that couldn't have happened if they were tied in to a, uh, an existing technology. It was actually the open standards that allowed that technology to be picked up in, and used in very new ways and drew, drove a lot of the services uh, that have driven um, smartphone development. So, so ARM's obviously very interested in ensuring these standards are, are made available to the world. Um, actually, uh, people have to trust the ecosystems and sometimes those ecosystems need people to stand up and invest in them to make them, make them exist. And without them, some of the um, advancements we've had wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred. So it's interesting to, to remember that. And, and the, the last one um, is actually platforms. Um, so platforms allow you to wrap up a whole load of complex technology in a way that someone can now not worry about that problem and move on to the next problem. Um, so this enabled the smartphone itself. But I think what's quite interesting is actually it also created a new industry. So the concept of apps on a phone, or you could talk, to, uh, look, um, take the analogy of Web2 applications on uh, taking web platforms. A lot of infrastructure had been put into platforms. It was very easy to build a, a web service. That actually created not only a load of applications that were not predicted by the people making the fundamental technology and could, could never have been predicted by the people making the technology, but it did actually create a new industry. And for me, this is a really important point. Because if you think about how apps are developed, initially, there was the pioneers. They worked on bits of technology. They got something out there. They tried to hit a jackpot. But actually now, and if, if you consider web technologies in, in a similar way, most businesses can comprehend what an application on a smartphone can, can do for them, how it can benefit them. They can also comprehend that it is possible that they could have one exist. And it's very plausible that they can go and contract someone to make it exist. There's no, there's no skill within the business itself beyond the point that it could conceive that it could benefit from one that, it, that actually needs to go and make this exist. So you're at, 
your application for you know, your John Lewis shopping or something like that, someone, someone understands that while you're in a store, you can do this, you know, they can comprehend a, uh, an interaction, a set of services, and then they can go and execute and make them exist. And I don't think anyone would have predicted kind of what was going to be popular apps, but also actually how they were going to be used. But for, for me, this is, this is really important because I, I don't hear many people talking about uh, the next generation uh, uh, of um, development as actually a new industry. It's an advancement of an existing industry, and I think, I think that might be wrong. So, so what's required to enable Internet of Things? Um, so obviously, ARM cares a lot about this. Making our partners successful in this area is, is very important to us. Um, so we've been working on this for a while. Uh, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm actually from our Internet of Things business unit. I'm on the management team of, of that business unit that's set up specifically to address this market. Um, but obviously, we've been working on the fundamental technology for a long time. Um, so we need these smart devices that have very low power radios, can uh, you know, be uh, made incredibly cheaply uh, and highly integrated. So that, so that actually adding intelligence and sensing and whatever is really not a, um, a cost compared to the value you can create by doing that. It really becomes a non-issue. Um, there's still a complexity of doing it, but again, that can go down. Um, standards, again, I think, I think we're very clear that to make this successful, a lot of the technology has to be based on standards to allow an open and competitive market, um, but also allow disaggregation of uh, companies and, uh, and, and the industry in general. Because until you can disaggregate the way things are put together, you can't have you know, buyer power. You can't have one thing being used for multiple applications. Um, and if you get that right, that, that uh, provides for a really um, successful industry to evolve. Now, um, some of you may, who are closer to ARM, um, last year we acquired a company called SenseNode who, who um, have actually pioneered a lot of these uh, internet protocols for these smart um, uh, IoT devices. Um, and we, and we want, the reason we did that is to make that sort of technology much more available um, to, uh, to the industry, to allow these uh, things to be created. Um, Ecosystems enabled by trust. Again, this is something, obviously, ARM's, ARM's in a very good position to be able to do this, but I think others are as well, and I think that's necessary to make this happen. Um, and, again, platforms. So we've been working on various research to understand what a platform for, the, uh, for this sort of um, industry might look like and, and been doing some sort of public research, I guess, to uh, test some of those ideas. But I think... Uh, it, so this, this, is, this is the obvious bit, and the, and the bit that I kind of want to get across is the next bit. So coming back to this, technology does not equal reality. This is, this is something that, from that platform that was made. I, I discovered it a, uh, a year or two ago that was used with one of our platforms uh, by a company to create something. Uh, it has a smartphone app. And I don't know if you can predict by the fact that it's got the name Daisy on there what this was. But this was actually for monitoring cows. So someone had uh, taken our technology and used it for, for monitoring cows. And, and this is because they understood that if they could monitor the yield of the, the cow and various properties of the cow, they could understand the health uh, and, and um, actually influence the, uh, influence the herd. So that, that sort of was surprising. Uh, this is the actual thing here. And then... There's this, you know, this is how it, you put it inside the cow, it turns out. Um, and maybe you can guess how you put it inside the cow. Um, and this is the sort of thing where you just go, what? You know, this is, we had no intention when we were building this sort of technology that it was going to be used in any way like this. And to be honest, even when we saw it, we didn't quite believe it for a while until you start thinking about it and then kind of go, well, yeah, that does make sense, actually. And... I can see this is an early version. It might get smaller, and then I might feel less sorry for the cow. And um, you know, you can see how. Okay, yeah, I get it now. And then it almost becomes obvious in hindsight. And I, I think this is going to be a natural trend that we'll see. The the point was we would have never guessed this, even, as much as all my engineers are incredibly clever. This is not what they would have predicted. 
So I, I think the thing to think about is the opportunity looks a lot more like the apps industry, not necessarily in terms of the value that the apps industry has created. That's not necessarily that much. But in terms of how uh, a platform uh, enabled other people to see how they could um, uh, use that technology to, uh, to address uh, needs that they, they see. And this comes back to the responsibility of actually being able to um, distill and disseminate the underlying uh, properties of uh, what's being built here so that people can understand what they can do. So there's basically two, two um, points I, I'm trying to get across here, and hopefully uh, I've managed to do that. The first one is it's actually the responsibility to educate uh, the market of what this technology is capable of. The things that I, I think actually are quite detrimental is often it's done in the way of examples that are actually incredibly trivial. So the connected fridge or the connected washing machine is a continual example of what, how this is going to be used. Um, often, you know, truck roll type things. There's a washing machine. If I can work out when it's going to break down, I can send for the, um, you know, the uh, repairman before it breaks down. Excellent. And people understand that. But if you kind of look at the web industry uh, or the apps industry, that was the trivial. That was them putting an online shop. But then suddenly you started doing things with that online shop that you could never do with a normal shop. So maybe if you've got this washing machine, um, you can now start looking at how people are actually using that washing machine. And maybe that influences your design of the machine. Or maybe you could do A-B testing. Websites do A-B testing. They try two different things to two different people. Uh, imagine you're trying to work out the profiles of the best washing for your washing machine. Doing that in a factory before you ship it out is actually quite hard and time consuming. You can only do so many uh, iterations, but you could actually do 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 experiments in a day across 100,000 washing machines. And some people get slightly bad, uh, worse um, quality of service, but everyone benefits. You know, there's like the wisdom of crowds. Uh, you could have a network inside that washing machine, so you remove all the wires. Actually, these are just all sensor boards. Remove all this expensive copper breakdown. And there's, if you actually look at um, industries that have gone before, the trivial thing was the obvious thing, but then that opened up a huge amount of opportunities. And by, um, oft often we're doing a disservice by explaining the technology in such trivial terms rather than the fundamentals that allow people to simulate what is possible. So I think e educating... Uh, not within the industry, but outside the industry, the people who are actually going to apply this technology is incredibly important, and I don't think it's done enough, um, especially as I can see there's a lot of focus on consumer in the public space. Um, actually, the more industrial um, doesn't really get a look in, and that, that means people aren't um, simulating. Uh, whereas apps, I'm sure, uh, maybe I just move in strange circles, but everyone was talking in the pub about what app they were going to build, um, and they could see how they could do it. But this, the, the, the main point I, I want to make is consider this will be a new industry. And I mean this in two different ways. In, in one way, there will be an industry set up that knows how to deliver this technology. It knows how to package it, and it knows how to uh, um, take this technology and actually make it usable. So there will be an industry to do that. But the most important thing is actually to think of it from the other side. There will be an expectation from companies that this should be as easy as I've decided I need a website. I've decided I need an app. And until that's the case, uh, that the, the real spark of this industry won't really happen. And, and personally, I think the way to drive that is not by building the technology. I think it's by uh, uh, educating the companies who can make use of it and incentivizing them to demand from an industry that doesn't really exist yet the, uh, the, the, the quality of service and expectation they have for delivering those sorts of products. That's, that's the sort of thing that will actually drive an industry to be created rather than evolve from where we are now um, to service what effectively is a new requirement for lots and lots of companies. I hope that uh, helps uh, you think about some of the, the ways we might want to stimulate um, the, the growth of this industry that isn't directly uh, based on the industry itself. I think the technology is kind of sorted. I can see how that's going to play out. But the adoption of that technology and the pull through for that technology, I think, is the, is the real area that I would be focusing on.
Thank you very much. I hope that was interesting.